what you find is, depending on the discount rate you use, our total accrued liabilities at the moment in the UK are between £4.8 trillion pounds and as much as £7.9 trillion. Pounds. Uh, uh, and it depends, again, I'm afraid, who you ask and what the discount rate is. But what you can see there is you've got Greece, Ireland, Italy, Japan, Netherlands, Portugal, Spain, uh, United... Sorry, I've read them from the top. France, Austria, Germany up there, United Kingdom and United States. And for all of these nations, our debt projections are sweeping away from us. There are some other lines other than the red on here, which are various adjustments for age-related spending. So these these lines are um, they're the debt in, so in the in, they're the debt in the sense in which you hear it talked about today. So if you look at the UK here, it's about a trillion at that point there. Sorry, it's 100% of GDP about there. I'm getting up to 500% by the time we get up to there. But this is debt as it's discussed in the terms it's discussed today. I have confused, you're right, I've confused two concepts there because I talked about accruing the pension liabilities. What I'm really saying is if you took these lines and folded them in today mm -hmm. the current, and took into account the current uh, accrual, pension accruals to living persons, you would find that our debt was up at 4.8 to 7.9 trillion. Are you the government, what the, what the state, what the state owes in terms of its accrued pension liabilities across the board is getting on for at least 4.8 trillion pounds. So, this is what um, an actuary said on the IEA's website about this uh, situation. He said that the UK is effectively an enormous, unfunded and effectively bankrupt pension scheme with a large speculative holding in some banks and a sideline in running a small island state off the northern coast of France. <laughs> and um, I, I keep, I've used this in Parliament, I said it then, I say it now, I wish he was exaggerating, but if you look at the size of the state now, and bearing in mind that when the state's this large, it's employing a large number of people to whom it's making pension promises, those pension promises emerge in our debt projections, and I'm afraid it is leading to the, that kind of language being used about our country's financial position. So, Keynes was not an idiot, and I say unfortunately, the reason for that is that I follow the Austrian school. Um, but Keynes did say this, I won't read the whole thing, uh, but I recommend it to you. Um, nobody else attributes this to Lenin, but it says a lot about what Keynes thought. Lenin is said to have declared that the best way to destroy the capitalist system was to debauch the currency. By a continuing process of inflation, governments can confiscate secretly and unobserved an important part of the wealth of their citizens. By this method, they not only confiscate, but they confiscate arbitrarily. And while the process impoverishes many, it actually enriches some. So it undermines, <clears throat> it undermines the wealth distribution of the nation. It under, undermines people's confidence in the way that society is structured and it works. So he concluded, <clears throat> Lenin was certainly right. There's no subtler, no surer means of overturning the existing basis of society than to debauch the currency process engages all the hidden forces of economic law on the side of destruction, and it does it in a manner which not one man in a million is able to diagnose. So let's hope then, you've seen already, I'm afraid, Ben's slides, but I usually say let's hope then that we haven't debauched the currency. I'm afraid it's too late. This is from the uh, Parliament House Commons Library and the Office of National Statistics. It's a composite price index back to 1750. Somebody saw this and asked me, could we have it on a log scale? And the answer is yes, it's in, uh, the, um, in the same paper on a log scale. What's happening here? Well, we've got some inflation. I'm not suggesting that at any stage here money was perfect. It wasn't at any stage here. But what's important for, for in terms of the value of money is that there was some inflation here. But then during this period of the Industrial Revolution, let us not forget, if you'd saved the pound there, then actually you saw a broad uh, increase in the value of that pound. This is pr price deflation, so this is the value of your pound actually increasing in terms of the goods and services you can exchange it for. <coughs> All the way through the industrial, uh, uh, is a trend, it's, it's, it, it, through the industrial revolution, money slightly appreciates in value with some little panics and so on to inflate. We get then into the 20th century. Now we're really off. Bear in mind the growth of the state in your mind. 
the state becoming huge through the 20th century. You get this massive spike halfway, halfway through the first uh, 50 years of the 20th century, big spike in depreciation of money, and then we're off. We're off. Money is away. In fact, if you look at this slide, you can see more clearly that we really get going around 1971, and then money just is losing its value at a furious, furious rate. There's all sorts of arguments to say that this is demoralizing in the widest sense. It, 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 it erodes people's morality. There becomes no point saving. You may as well consume. You don't save your old age. And these are the kinds of things that we are seeing in society. So we've debased money furiously. The state only funds itself by taking today, by promising to take tomorrow, and by debasing the money supply. So when I say inflation, as a follower of the Austrian school, I mean an increase in the quantity of money. And then increasing the quantity of money inevitably increases the general price level. Depends on how people are holding their cash balances, but there we are. How does money come into existence? Well, of course, you all know that. And guess what? Good news, there's at least one MP who knows as well. <laughs> I'm happy to tell you Douglas Carswell, MP, knows, and also the Earl of Caithness in the Lords. He, uh, he spoke brilliantly on this in 2009. So there are at least three of us. <coughs> I couldn't possibly say. I don't know. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we know about how money comes into existence. So I also want to talk about central planning of interest rates, which I think was mentioned earlier. Yes, this is, for me, one of the shortcomings of the mainstream thinking in economics, is to neglect the origin of interest rates. If I'm saving, then I'm expressing a, a preference to consume later. If I'm not saving, I'm saying I want to consume now. In extremis, if I'm borrowing to consume, then I'm saying I've really got a very high time preference to incre increase my consumption now at the expense of my consumption later. Are people with me? So if the amount of money that, I, that is available to borrow is the same as the amount of money, just suppose, the amount of money available to be loaned is the same as the amount that's really been saved, what you would then have is a supply and demand relationship in the commodity called money. And you'd be able to draw a little supply and demand chart with the rate of interest on one side, supply of savings, demand in borrowing, and so on. Now, in any other commodity but money, if you suppress the price of the commodity, it would disappear off the market, wouldn't it? And we know that. In the Soviet Union, they suppressed the price of meat, and you ended up that on the market, I mean, literally the street market, you'd find people selling a small piece of meat with a big bone attached in order to get the weight up to a level that people could produce it in order to uh, actually be, make it commercially viable. It, it always happens. If you, decrease, if you decrease a price artificially, what happens is that the uh, supply disappears down because you can't afford to produce it anymore, whilst the demand accelerates away. And that, is that or is that not what we have seen in money and bank credit over the last sort of 10, 15 years? It, it is, of course. We've got historically low savings and historically high borrowing. So if any other commodity would disappear off the market, but bank credit has not disappeared off the market, you of course know why. It has not disappeared off the market because the practice of fractional reserve lending allows banks to paper over the crack, paper over this gap, by extending credit in excess of real savings. And because they, we combine um, this fractional reserve feature with a range of other aspects of the banking system, not least of which limited liability and the lender of last resort in the central banks, that means that this process is effectively unlimited. So this is not done in any other commodity, but it's generally thought to be at least an acceptable idea, if not a good idea, by many, many mainstream economists, if they understand it at all, um, in, in money. So that's one of our key problems, the artificial lowering of interest rates in combination with fractional reserves. So Ludwig von Mises, I, I mentioned earlier, he was the, one of the key authors in the Austrian school tradition. Uh, his motto was from Virgil, it's do not give in to evil, but proceed ever more boldly against it. He was known as the last night of liberalism, and that was at the time when liberalism and capitalism were very much the same thing. Mises said this, credit expansion cannot increase the supply of real goods. That's, this is exactly what we do when we try to get the banks lending again, expanding credit. 
It merely brings about a rearrangement. It diverts capital investment away from the course prescribed by the state of economic wealth and market conditions. It causes production to pursue paths which it would not follow unless the economy were to acquire an increase in material goods. As a result, the upswing lacks a solid base. It's not real prosperity. It is illusory prosperity. It did not develop from an increase in economic wealth. Rather, it arose because the credit expansion created the illusion of such an increase. Sooner or later, it must become apparent that this economic situation is built on sand. Now, the tragedy is that he wrote this decades and decades ago. The theory of money and credit was written in the 30s. Human action, I think, was us getting on to the 50s. It depends which version you, you, you look at. He wrote a wonderful book called um, Causes of the Economic Crisis. It's actually the book that you can buy is a collection of essays he wrote before and after the Great Depression. Here is the tragedy. Mises was born into the Austro-Hungarian Empire, into an area which is now part of Poland. He is agnostic, but he was of Jewish descent. And he forecast the destruction of the... <laughs> He, he forecast the destruction of the Deutschmark, and he forecast that it would be followed by a rise in political radicalism. He wrote all of this in German. In German, It wasn't widely read in England or the US. He then had to flee the Nazis to Switzerland, and from Switzerland to America, when his work started being more widely read. In a sense, the Austrian school is a, uh, it represents a failure to accept an intellectual trend of the 20th century. And that trend was perhaps positivism, the belief that you could apply the methods of the natural sciences to the social sciences. I haven't got time to talk too much about this, but I believe that that is a category error. It is a category error to try to apply the methods of the, um, the natural sciences to social science. The information that you need is just not available. Um, I can return to that in questions if you wish. He also talked about the, in the course of the development of the banking system with fiduciary media, that is the media we use today as money, crises could not have been avoided. However, as soon as bankers recognised the dangers of expanding circulation credit, they would have done their utmost in their own interests, in their own interests to avoid the crisis. They would have taken the only course leading to this goal, extreme res restraint in the issue of fiduciary media. So there's some conflict there in what he wrote in the 30s compared to our situation today. There are some other uh, problems with the banking system. This comes from a paper by my colleague, Dr. Anthony Evans. I must say that Dr. Anthony Evans is not a 100% advocate. He's a free banking advocate of the Austrian school. But he's, that's opens up another subject. But he mentions these other shortcomings. There is a monopoly, a government monopoly on the base currency. The government gives, delivers a, a taxpayer-backed lender of last resort. There's deposit insurance. There is an inordinate amount of bank regulation. For all that people say it's been laissez-faire, it hasn't really. And there are legal tender laws. Someone asked earlier, why is it that this is not capitalism? I ask you, if you looked at any part of the system of human social cooperation and you found a government monopoly, government central planning, socialization of risk by the state, the privatisation of profit, would you say that that was capitalism or statism? I would say that is statism. So we do not have a failure of capitalism because it isn't, the banking system is not a capitalist system because it is riven with those, these flaws. This is going to become important if we have a further crisis and people are asking the question, is this a failure of freedom or is this a failure of the state? And I'm saying it's absolutely no doubt a failure of the state. If people are persuaded it's a failure of the free market and some demagogue comes along and says, I'll tell you what, let's shut down the free market and have more of the state, the danger people will vote for more of the state. That would not be a good idea. So this is where we are. There was a banking collapse. We know that. Banks are simultaneously failing, both <coughs> entrepreneurs and savers. It's staggering. Yesterday I was with a man, 33 years in business, successful, profit-making, it hits all the right buttons, he recycles, he intends to generate sustainable energy to feed into the industrial estate where he wants to build, and we could go on, he's going to create jobs, it's a fantastic business idea. He needs uh, 1.4 million pounds, which by commercial development standards is modest, can he get it from the banks? No. 